Damian Lewis, Wolf Hall has just completed its run here on PBS in the uh, United States. You play Henry VIII, and that's a that's of course a real life character, but a character that's been through you know all sorts of theater works and film and TV. So how, when you get that role, how do you make it your own? Um, well, I think in this particular instance, it was uh, this is an adaptation of Hilary Mantel's uh, book Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Body. So it was her reimagined um, life of Henry. Um, the success of the book. Were, I think was down in in large part to the fact that she went behind closed doors, imagined what these people might be thinking, feeling, and I think um, once we got together with Peter Kosminski, who shoots in a sort of verite kind of way, a sort of docudrama kind of way, I knew that there was going to be less of the, uh, you know, uh, grabbing uh, girls' bums and ch throwing chicken legs over my shoulder, kind of Henry VIII. There was going to be a more um, political um, and nuanced Henry. Uh, that's, what, that's what I hoped, anyway. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. It does kind of have that docudrama or documentary-style feel to it. Um, when you were discussing that as you prepared to take on the role, was that something that, that intrigued you about it? Um, yeah, I, I'd read the books and I loved them and um, I knew that uh, the adaptation would be in good hands with Peter Strawn, who's a fantastic writer. Um, and I've worked with Peter before, so I knew what Peter Kosminski, so I had a sense of what style he would bring to it. Um, and I think it plays like a political thriller when you read it, and it plays that way uh, in the our adaptation as well. It, it's this isn't a this isn't a, a, a roistered, doistering, you know, uh, wenching Tudor drama. This is um, this is much more um, it's much more of an interior drama. It's much more uh, about the looks thrown between men in darkened rooms. Um, every time everyone speaks, they feel they're on a knife edge. It could go either way. No one's sure of their career, of their head remaining in place. Um, as they do the bidding of this incredibly mercurial um, king. So I, I, I always felt that it was more... Um, you know, House of Cards than than the Tudors, if you like. Now, Henry VIII there in England, uh, and, and as you went to school and so forth. I mean, is he is he maybe the most famous royal figure of all time? Well, he certainly um, Henry VIII is certainly uh, well known for well, he's you know in in popular legend he's well known for marrying six times, divorcing twice, and Two of them got really unlucky and got their heads chopped off. Um, and, you know, he, he was a... But uh, Elizabeth I, his daughter, who fought off the Spanish Armada, she has a claim to being one of our most famous um, monarchs. Uh, Charles I, who, had, who was beheaded himself. Um, and our current queen, Queen Victoria, as well. You know, you would have to say that we've, we've, had, you know, uh, our monarchs have have got good, good brand recognition. And, and as you play Henry VIII in this project, what, how would you describe him? I, I I wrote down some words as I was trying to get ready for this, and I, I put down petty and vindictive and childish. Uh, but what, how would you describe him? Um, I think those things can be true of Henry. Um, I think he, you have to remember Henry wasn't destined to become king. He was the second son and his elder brother Arthur died uh, when he was young at 17, 18 years old and um, Henry ascended the throne. I, I think Henry from the outset wanted to create a court that would most wonderful court that had ever been, and he borrowed heavily from 
the chivalric traditions of the uh, Middle Ages, um, where, if you like, the myth, the Round Table, the great knights of the Round Table, where um, courtiers were great poets, composers, um, uh, singers. They were great jousters and riders. They were great sportsmen. They were great conversationalists. They were um, they were expected to be good, uh, know a couple of languages, to have read uh, the, the Greek philosophers. He grew up in a time when humanism was spreading across Europe. Everyone was reading people like Cicero and the Greek philosophers. Henry took that very seriously, but I think more than anything, he just wanted to create the idea that he was at the head of the most fabulous court that had ever existed. And so that manifested itself in uh, him going on a couple of, frankly, minor military excursions into France, but he wanted to be seen to be heading an army. Uh, he built great palaces. They wore extraordinary clothes. Henry in particular was a great peacock. He was particularly proud of the width of his calf muscles, uh, which he lauded over Philip the Fair of France. He always said he had better calf muscles than Philip. Um, these things sound petty, uh, to use your word. There's certainly, there's certainly a great deal of vanity that comes with it, but it had a political purpose too, which was to spread awe and wonder. Um, and um, to see England at the top of the tree. Um, and great scholars like Erasmus came and visited the court and said what an incredible young prince he was. Ambassadors from other countries came back and said, this is the fairest prince I've ever seen. Um, so it worked, if you like. Um, but Henry, yes, uh, was prone to violent rages, he was quick to temper, but he was also quick to laughter, and what undermined him in the end, though, I think, is this obsession with a male heir, and it saw him behaving, I think his behaviour became increasingly paranoid, and he became increasingly um, uncertain of his position. He, he became grossly fat, uh, and unhappy and maudlin and depressed as he became older. Um, all driven, I think, by a sense of suspicion of those around him and, and an increasing sense of paranoia. And these years that we see on Wolf Hall, he his overwhelming obsession is having a son. That 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 overrides almost everything in his in his mindset, wouldn't you say? Yeah, you know, it, it was although there had been female monarchs at that point, um, uh, you know, it was still the tradition, the convention that you would have a male heir, a male son, and he would ascend the throne. Um, Queen Elizabeth the first, in the end, did an extraordinarily good job of moderating the Protestant and Catholic extreme. Uh, factions in England through the 17th century, late 16th century and early 17th century. Um, but yes, that's right. He, he, he obsessed over having a male heir and um, that's really largely the reason for his, for his six marriages. Um, yeah. Uh, acting opposite Mark Rylance, we haven't seen him often really in films and TV. He's devoted most of his life to theater work. Uh, what did you know of him before this project? And talk about uh, just working opposite him. Um, I'd been a fan of Mark's for a long, long time. Seen him in the theater 20 years ago as a student. Um, seeing him do remarkable, inventive, creative work with texts that we thought we knew, Shakespearean texts. Um, uh, he was a large reason for me wanting to take the role, actually, and be part of the project. I wanted to work with him. And he was, um, he was brilliant, as you'd expect. 
in the role and but generous and warm and um, committed to the idea of an ensemble um, that's central to how he works and um, so working with him up close was was a was a pleasure. You know the thing about his performance too. Um, w when you're watching it, you're think I'm sure as an actor opposite him, you're thinking I don't know if this is translating on camera. But when you watch it at home, it it's just amazing all the little things he's doing. Yeah, you know, um, Mark has got the he's got the still center of a of a spinning world in Cromwell. Um, I, I've I've played those roles before myself, and you have to you have to be very still. You have to allow the world, the cameos, the characters, the the colourful events to whirl around you. Allow them to have their space, and while you are the spine of the show, and that was Mark's challenge uh, with Cromwell. Um, and I think he did exceptionally well with that. Cromwell was a man who listened and worked his way to the top um, by giving the king what he wanted. And that watchfulness that Mark has, that listening quality, where he, you never, you never feel that. Cromwell is confident that he will survive till the end of the week. So there's a great alertness to his listening and to his watchfulness. Um, you always feel like he's on the balls of his feet, um, waiting for a, a change of mood in the king, which could, you know, end disastrously for for Cromwell or, or anybody else. And Cromwell, and I think the other thing that Mark played very well is. There's this underlying sadness in Cromwell. He loses his family, um, and there's also this this worldliness to him. He is a a middle class, merchant class man who, because of his skills and his trade, has been all over Europe, travelled far more extensively than a vast the vast extent of the nobility, and um, knows that he's cleverer than most of them. So um, insinuates himself at Henry's right hand side, first Wolsey's and then Henry's. And, um, you know, uh, speaks the truth to power, which is why Henry loved him and wanted him close to him and came to rely on him. Well, you know, we're an awards website, so we're we're certainly thinking that you and Mark and maybe Claire and, and Jonathan Price all might make it into the Emmys this summer uh, on the uh, on the ballot and, and, and the nominations. But uh, and that's going to be wonderful. But I think also the production values on this are incredible, both from the costumes to the makeup to the production design, cinematography, all of that. Can you just talk about that world and how what they do from their side, the craft side, the technical side, informs what you do? Well, I worked with an extraordinary costume designer called Joanna Eatwell, who had a uh, fabulous um, person working alongside her called Claire. They were just they were they were fangirls of the period. They knew everything about the period, and the detail and the sumptuousness of the costumes was entirely down to them. Whilst Peter Kosminski was shooting it in a very present, uh, not overly presented style, so a very uh, immediate uh, reportage style, it allowed them to be utterly sumptuous with the costumes um, and the and to be totally realistic and true to period. Um, once I got on. Henry's famous square-toed boots. Uh, once I had a bit of padding in, which I didn't have initially because Henry, which few people know, was actually a rather slim, athletic build um, before he became uh, overweight. Um, uh, but once he starts becoming overweight, we start having the padding and um, 
the way in which she built out my shoulders because I'm naturally a slim man, you know, anyway. And so she built out the shoulders and the silhouette that she was able to create on me just helped enormously find his 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 majesty, uh, his imperiousness, um, uh, his great athleticism as well. That's sort of the great strength in the man. Um, and then Gavin Finney lit it entirely with natural light, uh, rigging up these fantastic little lighting rigs where he would put a uh, shelf of candles alight and set them alight, these candles, two rows of candles, much like you might see if you walk into a church and you light the rows of candles. And then he would surround them with a tin foil box and that would be his bounce board so that would be much like a photographer would use a foil in order to bounce light or a cinematographer would use to bounce light but he was doing it all with candle light everything was custom made so that you only ever had natural light in the room uh, and I think again that lends to its sense of um, authenticity and its, its period detail um, and I, uh, you know, those things help enormously help you get into character. They just, they just, it makes the whole thing feel more authentic. And of course, in England, we're blessed with you know, these incredible buildings that have been standing since the 17th century, 16th century. And we were able to film in some of them. It was actually at Penshurst, which is a great uh, Elizabethan palace and stood in the room where they believe Henry actually met Anne Boleyn and had weekends down there with her. So uh, in terms of being surrounded by the ghosts of history uh, and allowing that to feed your storytelling, uh, you, you, it's difficult to beat. Well, it's an outstanding project, and uh, just kudos to everybody involved. As we finish up here, I want to ask you about a couple of other things real quick. You're on the West, in the West End right now in American Buffalo uh, from David Mamet uh, and uh, John Goodman as uh, one of your co-stars. What uh, Tell us about working on that uh, so far. It's just been a, it's been a joy from start to finish. I, I love working with John. I love working with Tom Sturridge, who plays Bobby. Um, we have a great, great time. Uh, it's great fun being back on stage, and um, you know, Mamet is is such fun to play. His language is so percussive, jazz-like, rhythmic, uh, muscular. So it's always fun to play. People are loving the show. You know, we're we're, we're a sold-out run. So you know, what's you know, what's not to love? We're we're we we're in a hit show in the West End of London, and extremely grateful for it and I'm playing opposite Goodman and Sturridge each night and uh, we're having a blow. I've talked to other ma people that have done Mammoth uh, either films or, or plays and they all talk about you can't leave out a comma or a period or anything or it throws things off. He's you know David writes his he's uh, he said himself he writes his scripts like scores he grew up playing the piano so scripts really like scores. They have as much detail, whether there's a rest or a, a dotted minimum or a crescendo or the pace is slower or faster, just as you would have on a piece of sheet music. It's all written and it's and it's written, as you say, in in uh, parentheses, in periods, in in commas, in ellipses, in uh, pauses, just a change of paragraph, sometimes written in capital letters, sometimes written in lowercase. These things all have their own particular meaning and you work out what that meaning is as you rehearse. He knows his material very, very well, David. If you if you deviate, it doesn't work as well. It, it actually doesn't work as well. And that might sound overly prescriptive and controlling uh, and might sound like it takes the fun out of the out of the performance of it, the spontaneity of the performance of it, but actually there are still many, many different colors and nuances you can find within it. And um, that's, that, that's, that's what's been fun to explore as well. And I've got to say, people on our website are excited that you're uh, going back to work for Showtime with this new show, Billions. Uh, Paul Giamatti and you, is that correct? 
Yeah, I'm I'm having a good time working with uh, with great actors at the moment. It makes life uh, makes life a lot more enjoyable, and um, uh, you know, from from Claire and Mandy and others in Homeland and John now and uh, you know Nicole uh, last uh, year and Ewan McGregor and all sorts of fabulous people I've been working with over the last year and Andrew Riseborough and now I'm working with Paul Giamatti who I am also a huge fan of and um, this is going to be an interesting one I think I, I think this has a chance of of being a contemporary thriller story set in a contemporary context um, that in in small ways we'll be able to borrow I think it will reflect what's going on in the news as we tell our story and we'll be able to borrow from the news and have the news reflected in our show and in much the same way that Homeland was able to do um, which is what what made it so thrilling for, for a lot of people that it seems so current and I think this is something similar it's about uh, it's about a hedge fund billionaire and um, we've had a we've had plenty of those in our in our newspapers over the last seven eight years since the since the crunch uh, we know a bit more about what they do now uh, we have our views about them whether we like them or dislike them um, whether we think they're working in the public interest or for themselves so we have at the center of this piece we have these two characters this hedge fund billionaire and we have a US attorney and the US attorney is very clear what he thinks of the hedge fund billionaire and he goes after him and uh, this is going to be our cat and mouse story and Paul is playing the US attorney and uh, and I will play I'll play the hedge fund guy um, what Showtime have been doing brilliantly recently and what TV has been doing so brilliantly recently in the last seven, eight, nine, ten years is finding these wonderful flawed anti-heroes. So uh, uh, I would say Brody was one of them. Uh, uh, Carrie Matheson was one of them, is still one of them. And I think in this show, uh, and perhaps the, the greatest of all, or, or the one that really started it all off, was Tony Soprano. And um, in this show, I think you'll find that Paul's character is full of uh, full of complexities and uh, and darkness and light, and and as my character will be too. So we'll have these two wonderful, uh, ambiguous characters, shall we say, going cat and mouse. Uh, for a while, and I hope people enjoy it. Well, yeah, I would think as an actor, you don't want to play a hundred percent good guy or a hundred percent bad guy. That that ambiguity, that complexity that you mentioned, I think that would be so much fun to play. Well, it is. You know, he, uh, Brody was a was a gift from heaven. I mean, it was it was a you know uh, and home you know that was, he was the he was the epitome of. Um, you know, you were talking about Mark showing so little. Uh, I had to do something very similar with Brody, certainly in the first season. Um, what's this guy thinking? Who is he? Can we trust him? Uh, and it's, uh, it's difficult playing those roles, but you have to trust that it's okay to allow an audience to project their fears or hopes onto you. Don't show them too much. And uh, they're they're great fun to play. Of course they are. Um, um, and I I hope you know you can only be well you can be better than your writing as an actor. Uh, but uh, you in an ideal world you want to have the writing be so good that you have to rise to meet it um, and raise your game. And certainly that was true in Homeland. And. Uh, I got a good feeling about Billions as well. Brian Copperman, David Levine, Andrew Ross Sorkin, and other guys behind this. They're unbelievably talented and, uh, you know, fingers crossed. And what's the timeline for that? When does it finish? Uh, when does it go into production and when does it uh, air on Showtime? We will shoot for the second half of this year. You won't see it until next year. I'm hoping it'll come early in the spring, but we don't know that yet.
Okay, gotcha. Well, listen, thank you so much. Uh, I, I know you're having a, a ball on uh, on stage right now, but I just finished up watching Wolf Hall and really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, and thanks for asking me to chat. Well, we always enjoy chatting with you. Good luck on the Emmys this summer. I think a bunch of you will be there in that uh, in that auditorium over in September. Well, you said it. I'll 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 buy that. <laughs>